Let's talk about some of my neurodivergent traits that I had overlooked prior to my diagnosis. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So on today's video, I wanted to go over some of my neurodivergent traits that I had just thought for the entirety of my life were just humanistic traits of mine. But since getting diagnosed and since becoming very familiar with my neurodivergency, I have come to realize that these traits are, yes, humanistic traits, but they are also attributed to my ADHD or my autism. I have already made quite a few videos talking specifically about autistic traits, but as I was writing some of these down, I do realize that some of the things that I was talking about weren't just specific to autism. They are traits that non-autistic people can have as well. So those out there who may have ADHD or other neurodivergencies. And so I just wanted to expand this video a little bit further outside of the parameters of the autism spectrum. The reason why I feel like making videos like this is so important is because when you go through the DSM-5 and you read through the very few characteristics of what autism spectrum disorder is, it's really hard to contextualize those definitions and understand how that may fit in your own personal life and how they may fit within yourself, especially if you may be a person who is more high functioning. I don't like that term, but it's what we have to work with so far because research has yet to further and expand but anyways if you are a type of person that has been camouflaging masking and scripting your whole life it may be harder to truly understand what your autistic or adhd traits may be and so it's important to me to come on here talk about my neurodivergent traits so that those out there who may relate to me can feel a sense of representation but also reach a deeper understanding of themselves and their neurodiversity that being said not every neurodivergent person out there is going to relate to me. I don't represent every single neurodivergent person out there. That may be obvious, but you would be surprised with how close-minded people are and how ignorant people are. So I feel like I have to just reiterate that as much as I can in my videos. I am just one simple shade of the whole entire spectrum. I've come to notice that throughout my whole life, I've always looked to pictures or videos, basically media content to represent how I feel and convey it a lot more effectively than I myself can even convey it. I've always felt this disconnect between being able to express myself and my experience through words. I think a lot of it has to do with the autism. There is just this processing barrier for myself and it comes through being nonverbal. It comes through selective mutism, but it also comes through in my alexithymia where I can try really, really hard to be able to express myself. And these barriers also come up through my flat affect. I always felt like I couldn't seem to convey myself accurately for another person to understand. And all of these experiences of not being able to express myself properly is so frustrating. It's something that I still struggle with and have always struggled with throughout my life. There's so many times where someone will check in with me to see if I'm okay or to see if I'm feeling good or feeling happy about what we're doing. And every single time this happens, it's another reminder to me of how much I am essentially failing at conveying myself to another person because internally I could feel so content, so happy and just enjoying the moment to its fullest. But it seems like on the surface, what it looks like is just my flat affect. My facial expression doesn't seem to change. My tone of voice stays pretty consistent as well. It's just this level all throughout whatever emotion I'm feeling. Literally, if I'm angry, this is what I sound and talk like. If I'm happy, this is what I sound and talk like. If I am sad, this is what I sound and talk like. It doesn't change with my emotion. And the same thing goes with my body language. I noticed that because I am a person that has camouflaged and masked throughout my whole life, 
a result of suppressing all of these stims that I would have otherwise relied on in order to self-regulate and express myself, I naturally became more and more stiff and tense throughout my life and have lost access to body language to convey myself. And so, you know, I have the trifecta of body language, tonality of voice, and facial expressions. All of these three things are just very monotone. And as you can imagine, it's hard for another person to be able to read me when they're not really expressing how I feel. I must say, even though I do express that it is super frustrating, I do understand why people have a hard time perceiving me and interpreting my emotions, but it also doesn't mean that I don't get really discouraged when these things happen. But because of this inability to express myself accurately and for others to interpret me correctly, I have felt such a deep resonance with media throughout my life, whether that's movies, whether that's a TV show, whether that's a video I find online, on TikTok, on YouTube, whether that's a photograph or an art piece. A lot of the times I feel like what that person has created and how that makes me feel can encompass everything I'm trying to convey a lot more accurately than me. And so what that means is I oftentimes will find a specific scene or video clip and be able to relate that video clip to something specific in my life. And what I will do is I'll show that to a loved one of mine in order to convey a specific thing I'm trying to convey rather than me just explaining it myself. This may seem like something that is pretty insignificant, but I've come to realize that this isn't something that a lot of people do very often because if you think about it, for the most part, people don't really have issues being able to express themselves. I'm not saying everyone is perfect at it. What I'm saying is that there's not as many barriers to self-expression as an autistic person, right? With my boyfriend and I, for example, there's so many times where I'm trying to show him a movie in order to express the emotional state that I'm currently in or the lesson in life that I'm currently learning. And when I go and show these things to him, it means a lot to me because it's essentially me expressing myself to him in ways that I otherwise couldn't. And so if I'm showing him a movie and I don't preface the meaning of me showing it to him, and if he throughout the movie is not really paying attention or the moral of the movie hasn't really sunken in or like a specific scene of the movie, that is the part that can most accurately describe what I'm going through and he's not able to fully immerse himself into that scene, I get my feelings hurt. And it took a while of things like this playing out and getting my feelings hurt to realize that it wasn't just me wanting to share a movie with him that I loved or wanting to watch something with him. It was essentially me trying to express what I'm going through to him. And if he wasn't going to fully understand it, it was almost like my emotions were rejected or what I was trying to express was rejected. And so I know now that I have to be a little bit more direct about why I'm trying to show him a specific clip because I'm now aware that it's not just simply showing someone something, it's actually me trying to express myself and how I'm feeling to them. I notice that people typically, when they ingest content, kind of take it to face value. The only times they really take it personally is if the content is very specific and accurate in representing something that that person has been through. So if someone has always struggled with their relationship with their mom and the movie is only focusing on a child's struggle with their mother, people can cry and relate to that because it is such a strong resonance. But what I've come to notice is that with me, every time I watch anything or ingest any content, I am able to always find a way to relate that to something in my life. It's almost like I'm not able to ingest content without somehow personalizing it. And I think this is just something that I developed over the span of my life because I've come to realize that I can't seem to express the complexities of my experience better than 
a specific piece of art can. The next trait is in relation to the one that I just mentioned. I am very expressive over text. This is something that I've been deeply reflecting on recently because I have come to notice when I read back on certain posts that I may have made on social media or text messages that I may have exchanged with others throughout my life, I notice that I am so expressive over text and it always catches me by surprise because I am very monotone in person. And so it's always a disconnect between my persona online versus my persona in person. And in trying to understand the differences between these two personas, I've come to the consensus that who I am and how I express myself online is not necessarily a fake version of myself it's actually almost a more accurate representation of who I am and how I'm feeling. Just like how I explained with how I think media is able to express myself better than I can express myself, the same thing goes for texting and the same thing goes for writing things out. I noticed that I'm not simply able to just write my thoughts out into text and send them. I have this pressure that I put on myself where I have to not only write out my thoughts really well, but also convey the emotion behind the thoughts accurately as well. And so I really rely on emojis to a very heavy extent or pictures. I literally have a folder within my camera roll just with memes of emotions that I commonly experience so that when I'm sending a text message to someone, I could go through that folder and insert a picture of how I'm feeling to go with that text message. And if you can imagine how long it takes me to draft up these text messages and to send my responses, it takes a lot of time because a lot of thought goes through it. Not only am I going through images to represent how I'm feeling or what I'm going through, but I also spend the same amount of time and effort into looking for the perfect emoji as well. And I've come to notice that I can't really send a text message without also sending some sort of image or emoji along with it. It just feels very wrong to me because I can't have those tools accessible to me in person, right? If you think about it, an emoji is kind of like your facial expressions. So it's almost like when I am actually finally able to express myself accurately through emojis, through pictures, I want to utilize it every single time. It feels freeing in a sense because you can actually make it easy for once for someone else to understand you. I almost feel like there's an inverse between me and my loved ones when it comes to texting. I feel like I have really flat affect in person, but I'm very expressive on text. And I feel like my loved ones are very expressive in person, but on text, they're super monotone. All they really do is write out what they're thinking in a sentence and there's no emoji, there's no pictures. And throughout my adolescence, I used to read into that too much. I used to think, oh, is it because they're upset with me? Is it because they don't want to talk to me? But I feel like what it really is, is that people don't really need to rely on the nuances of texting in order to convey how they feel because they're able to do that for themselves in person, whereas for me, that's kind of like the only tool I have, so I really want to utilize it. Another neurodivergent trait that I've always overlooked was how much I resonated with movie scenes that had little to no dialogue. Throughout my life, I've always felt almost hypnotized and in awe of scenes in movies that had no dialogue and was primarily focused on the senses, whether that's the white noise, whether that's the music, whether that's the very intricate body gestures of a person and how they interact with their world, whether that's the lighting of the scene or the textures of the subjects on the screen. Every time a scene can really capture the sensation of the experience, 
I could just feel my whole being stimming in every way possible, in the best ways possible as well. And I feel like that relates to my neurodivergency, that relates to my autism in a sense where I experience the world like that. I have all of these very heightened senses, which in many times is not a good thing and it causes me anxiety. But in some instances, it allows me to really enjoy my life in the best ways possible, in ways that other neurotypical or holistic people are not able to enjoy. And when these movie scenes are able to capture that with the sounds and the sight, it just becomes so satisfying for me to be able to immerse myself in that scene and enjoy exactly what the director, the cinematographer, the actors are trying to convey to me. It's something that I can intrinsically understand 110% in ways that I can't understand watching a scene where there's a crap ton of dialogue. That's one thing I don't really resonate with and don't really enjoy is just verbal dialogue and nothing else. I think that's why I don't really like reality TV shows. And I think this is why I have a very, very soft spot for. I've also come to notice that I have always had a hard time understanding and interpreting facial expressions. Now, let me explain the complexities of this subject. I am not incapable of interpreting facial expressions and understanding it. I feel like a lot of the times people think that autistic individuals are not able to empathize, are not able to make eye contact, are not able to understand facial expressions. It's not that simple for myself or people out there like me. What it is, is that a lot of people are taught to mask their true emotions with a facial expression that is more appropriate. And because of this contradiction, it makes it really hard for an autistic person in certain situations to be able to read through those nonverbal cues and to understand that the facial expression may not be matching of what they're actually feeling. And another aspect of that is to then with ourselves understand what is appropriate for us to look like and to do in response to this person to be able to appropriately socialize with them. So let me give you guys an example to make that easier to understand. If I am talking to another person and I could surmise and feel that this person is not happy, that this person may even be angry, but if I were to look at their facial expression, I see that they're smiling and their tone of voice is really nice. From my perspective, my mental calculator is just going off because I'm just trying to figure out, okay, this person is not happy, but they look happy. So if that's the case, should I address the underlying unhappiness that I'm sensing or should I address their happy facade and continue to have that happy facade myself even though inside I'm actually in somewhat of a distress because I know that they're in distress. So I start to get really confused as to what am I supposed to respond to, what they're feeling inside or what I'm seeing on the surface. And a lot of the times I get lost in that process because there's times where I misinterpret that. You know, there's times where I might think that I feel an underlying emotion, respond to that underlying emotion, and that person gets upset with me because they think that I'm trying to project something onto them that they may not be feeling. I have to go through this Rolodex of facial expressions and emotions and appropriate responses and try to find a perfect matchup all throughout before I respond. And sometimes I end up getting stuck in that process because I either get overwhelmed or I might come to the conclusion that everything that I'm interpreting may be wrong anyways. And I might be scared to have any sort of response because I don't want to offend the other person or make the interaction awkward and tense. I always felt this general sense of confusion when trying to socialize with other people, trying to understand them 
them and trying to figure out what I needed to do in order to show up in the interaction. I was just always confused. That is the main word, always lost, always confused. Whether that means I was stressed, whether that means I actually did end up making the interaction successful, whether or not it was good or bad, uncomfortable, tiring, Either way, it always had this underlying feeling of confusion. Like social interaction never came naturally to me, no matter how comfortable I was with the person. Another really random neurodivergent trait that I overlooked when I was younger, uh, pardon me you guys, this one is really, really random. And it would be so entertaining for me if any of you did this as well. I had put myself in a lot of situations in life where I could have sensory deprivation. So I remember as a young girl during Christmas time, I would hide under the Christmas tree where no one could see me or find me. And I would just lay there and watch everyone from under the tree. I always felt this deep sense of comfort when I was underneath the tree because it was this confined space. It was dark and it was a little bit quieter in there. I could, for that moment, have my own little safe space away from social interaction, away from being perceived by others and just look out at the world and the people in it and just observe. Likewise, another thing I would do as a little girl was I would go inside of a locker and close the locker in on myself where I would just be in this really tight, completely pitch black space. Another example of this was I used to go night swimming where no one would be at the pool because it was super late. It would be super dark as well because it was an outdoor pool and there was no lights. I would swim out to the middle of the pool, let myself sink to the bottom, and I would just float there. What makes these experiences similar was that I felt this deep sense of peace, a deep sense of flow, and a deep sense of calm through not having to hear all of these overstimulating sounds, not having to withstand all of these lights. I feel like these little pockets of sensory deprivation was something that I was always trying to immerse myself into, but I didn't realize that this was because of my neurodiversity and having so many sensory sensitivities. But that's the beautiful and yet confusing thing about being later diagnosed with your neurodiversity is that you realize that there was moments throughout your life where you were trying to accommodate for your needs but didn't necessarily know that that's what you were doing, right? And it's not until after you're learning about neurodiversity and learning about your own neurodiversity where you're like, oh my God, all of those times where I was floating to the bottom of the dark pool or locking myself in the locker or hiding in these dark spaces, I was actually trying to give myself some sensory deprivation in order to help regulate myself in moments where I might have been overstimulated. All right, you guys, we have reached the end of today's video. I hope that this has been enlightening for you. And if any of you guys relate to any of the characteristics that I talked about in today's video, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, I know I see the analytics. Half of you guys who watch my videos are not subscribed. So if you wanna stay up to date to all my neurodivergent content, subscribe to my channel. It is a great way to support a small little neurodivergent creator like me. And if you want to further support me, you could give this video a like, leave a comment that helps boost my algorithm. It helps other people out there who may benefit from watching my videos be able to find me more easily. And of course, if you feel up to it, you could always donate to my channel by hitting that heart thanks button down below or going to my Etsy shop and purchasing some of the workbooks that I made to help you understand your neurodiversity more. These are all the ways that you can support someone like me. Thank you for those of you who have been supporting me so far and will continue to support me. I love you guys. I will see you on next week's video. Take care.